We're live. All righty. And everybody ready to go. <laughs> It is March 22nd, 2018. I'm Micah Sargent, and right now we are going to talk about GDC, Fortnite, Facebook, and so, so, so much more and everything in between, because this is the iMore Show. Joining me this week, all the way from GDC, are two awesome guests. Uh, it is Russell Hawley and Lori Gill. How you doing? How are things Hello. going? Good, we're doing good. We're in our wonderful luxury hotel, uh, just about to head out to the GDC to uh, meet all the cool people, play all the cool games, go to the panels. Today, Apple is doing a Metal 2 panel, which I'll probably be at, so I'll let you all know everything there is to know about uh, Metal 2 after, after that. Hopefully. Have you had your morning caviar and truffle oil? <laughs> yes, yes, we, <laughs> we've already had the, the um, the servants come in and give us grapes. And <laughs> Excellent. <whatnot. laughs> uh, uh, secondly, we have special guest Luke Filipowicz. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I've been writing furiously and playing a lot of games this week, as I'm sure we'll talk about uh, later in the show. But uh, it's been an insane week for mobile gaming. Yeah, quite. And last but not least, it's the one and only Serenity Caldwell. How you doing, Ren? Hi, Micah. I'm doing well. I am. Uh, I'm looking forward to listening to what's going on in the gaming world. Quite honestly, as as, as you guys might have guessed, we have a somewhat gaming centric show for you today. Although we're also going to spend some time talking about Facebook. Uh, so, I mean, we, we should definitely break right into it. Uh, what I, I saw, Russell, you tweeted about uh, sort of needing to take some time to step back and just process all of the cool things that you saw. Um, what are, now that you've had a little bit of time maybe to process some of that, what are some of the cool things that you saw? Yeah, so we've actually had a couple of really interesting, uh, both panels and, and experiences, you kind of hands-on things that we've done. Uh, we sat yesterday through uh, one of the developers behind ARMS for Nintendo Switch and went through all of the things that they actually learned from Mario Kart in order to apply it to this fighting game, which is a weird kind of concept given that Mario Kart is decidedly a racing game and, and racing and boxing don't typically have a whole lot in common. It was really interesting to see that the lessons that they learned about balancing gameplay based on luck and skill uh, and, and using those as kind of key components to making the game work. You know, it's, it's not just about skill, it's not just about luck, but it's that weird balance that Nintendo tries to uh, strike with a lot of their games. You know, Mario Party and, and even a lot of the mobile games. It was really cool to see them talk about that. Uh, I also climbed into an actual boxing ring uh, and uh, punched kind of thin air in virtual reality. Uh, they did this uh, uh, game, the Servios team, is doing a game based in the Creed movie. Uh, it's called Creed Rise to Glory, and it's it's a boxing game, but it's a boxing game that's built uh, just to get you to throw punches as hard as you physically can, um, which is probably gonna result in some broken windows at some point, but uh, <laughs> it was just deeply entertaining to play. I was uh, filming, Russell, just for one of our little videos, which we have up and we'll link it in the show notes. Um, I was standing kind of in front of him when he first started, and I was afraid that I was about to get punched in the face because he came out so hard with the punches. Like he knew what he was doing. He was not doing, you know. He wasn't pulling hard. punches. You no, know, the game he directly was... encourages you. Like you start off in this little uh, gym, and Rocky Balboa is standing in front of you, and very specifically tells you that you need to throw real punches. Yeah, it was pretty cool and a little oh, dangerous. Awesome. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's so cool. Okay, I have to say also that I am incredibly jealous because if there's one gaming, well, not even gaming, but just like one device that I've always wanted to try, it's the HoloLens. And Lori, I saw that you got to try it. Can you just tell us what that experience was like? It is kind of incredible. So I don't really know a whole lot about VR, so I'm not going to have a good judge of what's great and what's not great. But HoloLens was amazing because I was able to experience virtual reality while still seeing the real world overlaid or behind as the background of everything that I did. 
um, so they showed me um, these uh, sort of demos of what what's possible and let me kind of access some internet related things and stuff and and so the, this it starts out there's this ballerina that's dancing around a ta on a table and I, you can move around the entire room and she's on the real physical table that's in the real world she's on top of that and I can walk around the table and see her from all different angles and then I can look up at a wall and see um, a web browser. And then I look up on a different wall and there's a game that I can get immersed in. And one of the things I like the most about the HoloLens, I was talking with Russell last night about it, um, I see HoloLens as being an actual computer, a usable computer for the everyday person. Like most of the VR things that I've seen, it's specific to gaming. You're not supposed to use it as your computer. But with HoloLens, I can absolutely see this as something that you put on the day working on your computer in HoloLens. It, they even have notifications that will pop up to let you know if you have a meeting coming up or, or a text message coming through. So in your world where you're focused and you're working on your, you know, on your, your browser that's up here in your, in your eyes right in front of you, you also have access to the real world. It's pretty impressive. I so can't wait for... Uh, well, so as as an augmented reality experience, like in comparison to something like ARKit or Google's new put, well, relatively new push now, especially into AR, um, what how how does that compare? Like having this device on your head versus sort of holding up your phone and doing AR that way. I, I would imagine there's some somewhat of a difference. The main difference being. Um you don't have to hold your phone up for one, but even if you had um, some kind of lens that could do the work for you, um, HoloLens, it, it's much more immersive than, than what you would use with, with AR on a phone. It gives depth. So like I was saying, um, it, it's not a solid panel in front of you and the world behind you. It, combines the world with what you're looking at. So it goes beyond just, you know, just this physical thing in front of you. It, it brings them together. Um, and uh, it's not quite virtual reality. It's not quite augmented reality. It's mixed reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, or it's like uh, almost like idealized AR, like what you would actually want from AR. It's, it's mm -hmm. sort of like how we call inductive charging wireless charging, but it's not like true, true, true. This is like if AR is going to be AR, then it has to be like your reality augmented as opposed to let's put this thing in front. Uh, so that, that's that's again, I'm I'm super jealous. Did, did they? And then we we should I should stop trying to get you to talk about Hololens. But did they offer you a um, a Minecraft uh, demo? Darn no, it! Not I one. really want to play Minecraft in AR so bad. Uh, um, okay, well, so those the 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 boxing and the uh, Hololens, uh, Lori. What was something? that that you saw there that sort of stuck out to you so far something that was just you know something you're excited about trying soon or uh that you were interested um, in i i think that i will be an oculus uh uh transplant i don't know I, I, they won me over we watched them oculus talk about the future of their company and i got to see a little bit more information about um oculus go yeah. which is coming out later this year and it's really impressive. It's a standalone um, VR headset that it's going to be capable of doing quite a bit, and it's going to be relatively inexpensive. It is the entry level VR headset for every person. And I have a feeling that I will get Oculus Go, and then later they're going to um, launch Oculus Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, thank you. And I will probably get that too, because I'll have Oculus Go and I'll realize how much more I want. And Santa Cruz is basically the next iteration of Rift. It's going to be more advanced, have more features. Um, it'll be something you have to plug into your computer to use. But once I, I have a feeling that once I'm, I've been playing around with Oculus Go, I'm going to want to take it to the next level because it's so impressive. The, the graphics on, on what Oculus has done with their gaming is super impressive. Um, so that was that's my takeaway so far is that I have not yet delved into VR. 
I think partly because I'm so Apple centric and Apple hasn't really delved into VR that much up until very recently. So being at this convention, I'm realizing how incredible AR and VR and mixed reality are um, to our future. And it it's a lot more exciting than I realized. So I'm, I'm pretty close to being all in on that. Awesome. This, this, by the way, is the consequence of spending 72 hours with me in like a contained burst <laughs> is that now you're like, I don't have a wallet anymore. I'm just going to buy all of these headsets. So, buying all of the VR, all of the VR. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Luke, as our, as our games editor, um, I think that you are well equipped to sort of uh, do some interviewing here too. I'm curious what questions you have uh, for the two of them and, and sort of what, what your eyes have been on in terms of GDC. I think... My biggest thing with VR and and AR, or specifically VR more so, because AR is becoming so much more um, mainstream in a way, especially on mobile uh, gaming uh, with AR Kit and Google's new push uh, into uh, the AR world. But with VR, I still like. I want to be. I want to be in on it. I really do, but I still am sort of that consumer that doesn't really want to buy. I mean, kind of like what Lori was saying how I know I'm, I have a Mac and Apple is, hasn't really made a huge push yet into, you know, like VR headsets and things like that. And I think it still seems like too high of a price point for me and to, you know, get a gaming computer and then get the system on top of that. And then the games on top of that, it's a lot to invest. And I think VR is really cool. I've, I've, I've tried out a Vive, I've tried out Oculus. I've seen the stuff that's out there. And I'm always like, man, if there was just some way to make this just a little less expensive, um, they would probably have me as a consumer. And I think that I'm probably not the only one who feels like that. And it makes me wonder, I don't know if they've talked about this at all, but with things like Oculus Go and um, the, you know, the future that way, are, is there any talk about like lowering the entry like level to get into, into this stuff? Because I feel like that's a big barrier VR still. So the Oculus Go is going to be price point at uh, $199. And I think like for what you're getting, that's a great entry level price. I think a lot of people are going to spend $100 or $200 on, on a VR headset. Um, it's, you, you, don't need, you don't need, um, it's not uh, PC specific as far as I know, right? Um, it's standalone, so it uses its own. It's sort of like having, they were describing it, it's sort of like having a phone in a headset, it's just that the phone isn't there. It's got the guts of the technology, but it doesn't actually need your phone to work. Um, so uh, Luke, I don't know if maybe $200 is still too much for you, but that to me, that's a great price point as, as an entry level device for people trying to get into VR and you don't need any extra stuff to just get started with it. And their game prices range around five to $10. So even the, the software that you're investing in is reasonably priced. So I think later this year, we're going to see a lot more people getting into the VR, AR um, world just because Oculus Go, I think, is they're kind of the first that are going to make it to market with a reasonably priced device that's standalone, that you don't need a phone, that you don't need a special computer, that you can just kind of out of the box start using. That's super exciting. Like that's like to hear that. I didn't hear the price stuff. Like I'd I'd seen I'd seen uh, you know lots of tweet tweets and stuff about it and your your coverage, but I didn't quite hear the price part. And that that's really exciting to me. That actually the fact the fact that it's like two hundred dollars is a, a good price range. Like that's not you know that's bringing it's, it down it's game from console price range. Yeah, it's game console price range. And the fact that it doesn't need to be hooked up to you know some sort of fancy machine because that, I think that's actually the biggest hurdle for me. It's like I can maybe justify spending like five hundred or six hundred dollars on a headset, but then I have nothing to connect it to, and I don't I can't justify buying you know a whole computer when I have enough stuff that I need already. So that's actually really exciting and uh, will really make me like look at Oculus go as as sort of maybe the first VR thing I'll actually be able to have in my household, which is nice. So that's super exciting to hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in terms of other GDC, I just because I'm I'm still obsessed with Pokemon Go uh, as a gamer and obviously super excited for Wizards Unite, Harry Potter, Wizards Unite. Uh, I have been trying to keep an eye on seeing if Niantic has done anything, but I haven't really seen or heard anything. I don't know if you guys have seen or heard anything on the show floor at all. Niantic is not on the show floor this year. Uh, and <sighs> they, they're not doing meetings, which is kind of funny because if this building here wasn't here, we'd actually be able to see 
Niantic's office. Uh, <laughs> right, they're right there. They are right we could, here. We could shout to them. Uh, yeah, you should just walk over. <laughs> uh, but what we did see was a lot more detail regarding uh, Google's uh, map API layer for gaming, uh, which is going to enable a whole lot of other games uh, that are in this style. Not, not necessarily Pokemon Go clones, uh, but it's a lot of flexibility for all kinds of game developers to pull in real-time map information into their apps and, and do everything from create an animated map like you see in Pokemon Go to create simulated versions of cities that you'd be able to just deeply interact with. Like, you know, imagine an AR kit game where you've got kind of a cityscape that you're building stuff in and you can actually like lean in and see, you know, downtown New York, but in actual true scale detail. Yeah, super impressive. I, I'm looking forward to seeing what developers do with the Google, uh, the Google API uh, kit. It's, it's pretty fantastic looking. Any more questions out of, out of Luke? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, other than that is like, what's maybe a quick question, if you guys can both hit this, like what's so far been the biggest surprise for you at GDC? I know you're still sort of in the midst of it and you might be surprised even more later, but what's sort of been the biggest surprise so far? This is going to be a really silly thing. Uh, the people behind Fortnite have a mechanical bull in the middle of the game hall that is dressed up like a llama uh, that they are encouraging people to climb on top of and ride. <laughs> and <Yeah>. it has <laughs> not been even close to a serious ordeal the entire time. There's like someone screaming at people like through a bullhorn. Uh, and and it's funny, but I can't help but imagine people who don't know anything about Fortnite are just terrified of whatever's happening in this weird little square. <laughs> Though I'm not sure there's anyone right now that doesn't know That's probably true. <laughs> anything yeah, about Fortnite. Yeah, that is Fortnite. probably true. Yeah, especially in that place, for sure. I think my um, biggest uh, <laughs> we have my light in this in the in this hotel. It uh, it's it's censored, so it will turn off <laughs> automatically. We're not moving around enough to make it. <laughs> oh, that's that's too much sleep now. Yeah, uh, my my biggest surprise, and actually, I'm I'm the the dumb one who didn't realize that it was already out. I love this game called Kingdom of Loathing, and I re I discovered at GDC that they have a new game called West of Loathing um, that's already available on Steam. And um, to my surprise, uh, I just discovered that they will, it will, the, at Nintendo's Nindy Awards or Nindy announcement, um, it's coming to Nintendo Switch. So I'll be able to play West of Loathing on Nintendo Switch. And I am super excited about that because that game is hilarious. <laughs> Uh, that uh, all that sounds really exciting, and uh, I'm curious if anything can top uh, <laughs> bulls in the middle of in the middle of the floor. Um, and also, now I am delighted by the fact that you have sort of the the dark side, if I can use that pun, of uh, motion sensing yeah. <laughs> uh, technologies in in the hotel room. That's uh, too bad. Uh, anything else from from GDC that you both wanted to touch on before we move on to talk about Fortnite? No, I don't think so. I think Not we're good. <laughs> All we're right. Actually, to... one weird thing, uh, which we're actually going to see later today. Uh, Atari is making a, a small console box like the Nintendo Classic that they are calling the Atari box that has a whole bunch of Atari games loaded onto it. Oh, wow. Uh, be able to plug into a TV. It's got like the classic Atari joystick as well as like a proper game pad. It looks just like a 2600. It's got like the little toggle switch on it and everything. Yeah. I can't wait. So we're oh, going to go check that out later today. And that's going to be, that's going to be a pretty good time. I think. That's amazing. I still have a 2600 that we pull out every Christmas with my family. <laughs> oh, it's at my family's awesome. house in like a very like specific storage box that's supposed to be like moisture proof and like keep the, like, to, cause we've, it's been kept in really good condition over the years. Some of the games have deteriorated a little bit, but um, I still have a 20, uh, a 2600 that we pull out every Christmas uh, to play with my family. So uh, it would be cool to get a bit of an upgraded version. Although obviously every Christmas I'm still going to pull out the, the oh, original yeah. Like yeah. old school. Yeah, and it'll only come with select games. You're not going to be able to get card. I, I actually, I don't know yet. We'll find out today. But I don't think if it's anything like the Nintendo Classic, it it comes with a certain number of games, and without jailbreaking it, you won't be able to add more games to it. 
All right, well, done we're done talking about GDC. <laughs> for, for now, at least. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to talk about Fortnite. I have to say that I am completely 190%, if that's possible, ignorant to what Fortnite is, what you do with it, like what kind of game it is. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Luke. Uh, I will play the the unknowing audience member who is amazed by all the things that you have to, to tell us. What is Fortnite? How do you play? How do you get good at it? What's what's everything? Start with Luke. <laughs> what's everything? All right. Well, hilariously enough, um, and we'll well I'll touch on this in a second. But I'm at, I was more familiar with Player Unknown Battleground or PUBG as it's uh, familiarly known, uh, and that mobile game also just launched. But Fortnite is a very similar game, or at least the battle royale portion, which is what the portion that came to mobile this uh, past week. That's a very similar game to PUBG. Uh, and essentially, it's a big. Um, the basic game is you're you're one person versus 99 other people on a giant map where you start off with nothing. You have to loot and find all your guns, all your uh, ammunition, all your uh, clothing at the beginning of the game. When you first start a new character, you start in your underwear. Um, oh wait, no, sorry, that's PUBG. I'm already confusing them already. I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, but Fortnite's still the same in the fact that you have to find all your loot, you have to find all your equipment, and then you are on a map, you're on one single map, which is very, fairly big, uh, but it does slowly shrink and shrink and shrink until eventually there's only a couple players left and you're on this little tiny spot of the map and you're trying to survive to the end, to uh, kill off the enemies and uh, be able to uh, survive to the end and be, and be the winner. Um, it's uh, gotten super popular. In fact, I, I think it's even more popular uh, due to the fact that it's actually completely free, uh, the Battle Royale mode on across uh, consoles and, and PC and Mac. Um, and I think it's even surpassed popularity in PUBG. Um, but it's been around for about a year now, or last year, I believe it came out. Um, and it's been super popular. And then when they announced that they were doing an invite event, uh, for mobile, the whole world kind of shook. Um, and it's uh, now it's still only an invite only game, uh, but you can get it on mobile. And I think the most fascinating part about it is it's pretty much the same game. There's a few differences that make it a little more mobile friendly, uh, but it's the same, it's the same 100 man battle. You can do it with teams if you want, just like uh, the console version. The graphics are like, Obviously not quite as good as console because you know the limitations of the hardware you're playing on, but the graphics are fantastic. Uh, and the game runs, at least on my iPhone 8 Plus, I haven't tried it on anything uh, lower than that yet, but it runs phenomenally smooth. Um, it's quite impressive. I've been super impressed with how both games, Fortnite and PUBG Mobile, have been able to sort of adapt um, such a big AAA console experience into such a small screen and still make it feel, um, still make it feel really legit and not at all. Um, it's like not a crappy port that you that you know is just a throwaway for some extra cash kind of thing. It really feels like they took the time to to make these mobile game to make these giant games and turn them into a, a mobile friendly uh, game, but still keep pretty much all the same stuff that you loved um, or that you do love about the PC and the console version. Um, and both games have done that really, really well. And I've been super impressed uh, playing both games, going back and forth. And pretty much this whole week, I've been I've been playing around a PUBG, closing it out, playing around a Fortnite, closing it out, writing some stuff, and then just wash, rinse, and repeat that process for you know however many hours there are in the day. Uh, and that's just been my life for like the last two weeks. And I've been enjoying every minute of it. Uh, and it's really cool to see. Um, as somebody who hadn't really played Fortnite and only played a bit of PUBG uh, on on my friend's Xbox every now and then, uh, it's interesting to see because I'm I'm such in the mobile gaming world and I, I use that as a um, I use that as like my almost my main gaming source other than maybe my Nintendo Switch as well. Uh, it's been so interesting to see sort of like um, the Fortnite versus PUBG crowds come out and sort of bring it uh, bring their you know their hilarious beef. Um, which some people take too seriously, let's be honest. But they're hilarious beef uh, to the mobile scape, and uh, it's it's hard. It's hard. I'm trying to actually right now. I'm writing an article, which will be up hopefully later today, sort of about which one gives you the better mobile gaming experience, and it's they are so close. 
to both being amazing. Uh, in fact, they are both amazing and they're so close together that it's almost impossible to necessarily pick a certain one. But uh, um, yeah, both games have been have blown me away. And I I can't believe at just the the scope that they've managed to to capture in these mobile games. And it's super exciting for the mobile gaming space in in general. So yeah. Luke, can you talk at all about the the latency that gets introduced? Because these are these are games where one hundred people are, are playing in the same space, right? Yeah. Like like even in a console, we usually see like four on four or like like sixteen on sixteen is a big deal on on a console or even in PC. Uh, you know, so so having these one hundred uh, you know people playing against one another was a big deal on a console. Uh, but with with mobile environments, you're introducing a whole new array of latency on a mobile network. You know, I can walk uh, down the street in my neighborhood and know that my connection is very different. You know, across the the quarter mile that I would take to walk to the the coffee shop down the street. Uh, but there are people who are going to want to walk around and play these games. And when we've been playing these games, and uh, the the connection, you know, with other players being any different when compared to playing on the console or on your computer? Yeah, so obviously being a mobile game, you're gonna have the same, you're gonna have the greatness of a mobile game, which is you can take it anywhere with you, but you're also gonna have some of the, uh, you know, downsides of that, uh, which is this game does require internet connection, so you need you do need, obviously, if you're playing with multiple people, you're obviously gonna need internet connection, whether that be a Wi-Fi connection, you know, at your coffee shop or at your home, or if that's just you using your data. Um, but yeah, I've, I mean, obviously when I'm playing at home and I'm on my own home Wi-Fi network, which is fairly decent Wi-Fi, uh, it's pretty stable. I haven't really noticed any, any hiccups or anything. I have taken it out on a few walks. I've gone to the park. I've, you know, took a bus ride or two with it. Um, and I haven't noticed too much. I mean, you do eventually get some latency if, you're, if your phone is struggling to keep the connection. Uh, and I've been kicked out once. Um, and that was in Fortnite, uh, and I got kicked out once because my phone, I guess, lost the data for a second, and it, you know, picked up on my phone. So that is definitely a that is definitely a challenge uh, with a game like this is trying to keep up those connections while taking it on the go. Um, and your mileage is obviously going to vary on this, depending on how you know well your your data network is or how much data you have, since it does use a decent amount trying to trying to uh, uh, keep the game up and running. Uh, but in my experience, it's actually been a pretty smooth um, transition when I've, I've uh, I even actually did the test uh, of like staying on my home Wi-Fi and then just like walking out of my apartment to go to a coffee shop so that I would just like fall off the Wi-Fi, which I know can screw up a lot of different applications. And it actually like, whether this was just the way it worked out or it was something Fortnite did as well, but it actually switched over to the data pretty pretty seamlessly and I didn't even really notice that, that much of a change. Um, so I thought that's interesting. I don't know. I don't know how much. I haven't really looked into it yet. I don't know how much they've done on their side with that, or if it's a lot more just the luck of the draw with your service prov provider and you know the Wi-Fi networks that you have access to. Um, but yeah, with with a mobile game, uh, with a mobile game, that's sort of the, that's always sort of the pro and con, especially with anyone that needs uh, you know an internet connection. I mean, how many times did, especially when Pokemon Go was new and the servers were kind of you know iffy. Um, how many times did I get kicked out of that game just walking around my neighborhood? Probably more times than I could count. Um, so unfortunately, that is that's still with any mobile game that requires an internet connection. That's always going to be, I guess, an issue slash something you need to be aware of. Um, but I've been very impressed with with how the game is run, both on when I'm just using my data um, and I'm you know out and about, or if I'm at home on my on my Wi-Fi uh, connect work. The one thing I will say uh, because my data is definitely on this a bit on the slow side um matchmaking is definitely uh, takes a little more time um in uh uh when you're on uh when i on data in my experience um typically when i'm on my my wi-fi especially since there's lots of people playing fortnite and PUBG mobile um like it's usually pretty quick when i'm on my home wi-fi to sort of find a game and then i'm in the matchmaking uh you know little space where you can run around and like within 30 seconds usually a game is launched because there's enough players um, with, uh, with data, I think it's just, um, cause that's when the game's also sort of loading. That's why you go into that sort of pre-space cause it kind of loads the map and does some of the preloading in that, uh, in that space. 
um, to make it a little easier when the game actually runs. Um, but I found that the matchmaking can take a little longer. Like if sometimes I've noticed like about a minute, maybe a minute and a half before a game really gets going. Um, but other than that, I find that uh, I find that it's it's done pretty well, uh, at least in in my life, kind of taking it around um, and making an actual you know not just mobile because it's on my phone, but mobile because I'm actually mobile with it, which is nice. Great, that's good to know. We'll see what happens after the beta ends and it's open to the public. Yeah, uh, it's the... there might be a breakdown of the system at that point. Well, or funny maybe they're rolling it out. Good, well, so that when it actually is public, it's not going to be that much different. Yeah, and I mean, I should maybe just quickly touch on. I'll I'll do the PUBG mobile side of that since that also launched and that is in that's open now. That's worldwide. You can download it. You can go. Um, can and you I tell say me that again, what that stands for? Uh, player players unknown players unknown battlegrounds. Players unknown battlegrounds. Yes. Okay. Most people call it PUBG. <laughs> Um, and PUBG Mobile being the official mobile port of the game. Um, but that is open and that is wide. And I was expecting that to be maybe run a little less smoothly. But once again, I'm not sure how they're doing it. I guess they have good servers. And uh, in my experience, it's it's been pretty seamless as well. Um, I'd say it has the same the same uh, sort of uh, the same sort of problems that Fortnite does when you're when you're on uh, when you're on um, a data network, which is like matchmaking takes a little longer, but overall it's still been a really smooth experience. Um, and yeah, PUBG, like I find that even with PUBG being PUBG mobile being worldwide, I thought maybe it was going to have more problems, but it's been just as smooth. Um, and yeah, so it'll be interesting to see when Fortnite finally, you know, stops just the invite only um, kind of time and sort of just releases it on the app store. I wonder how much more by that time, how many invites have they, gotten already how many friends have you know used their invite codes to invite everybody i wonder how many people are actually playing the game already because i mean fortnite what was it within the first 72 hours they made like a million dollars on in-app purchases mm -hmm. um and uh so clearly people are playing it and clearly people are you know enjoying the experience enough to uh sink some money into it um and I, just to just to note for anybody who might be wondering uh both fortnite and PUBG, they both do have an in-app purchase but they are cosmetic from what I understand. I haven't seen anything that's um, game breaking in any way. Like no one's going to be my, like, you know, drastically better than you because they bought a certain thing. It's all cosmetic stuff, different skins, different looks, different, you know, clothes, things like that. Um, so it's definitely not necessary. I haven't spent any money on it and I've been doing just fine. Um, so uh, yeah, I think, I think that's an interesting I also think the the differences between the way Fortnite is approaching the mobile space and PUBG Mobile is approaching the mobile space has been really interesting as well. I was they both ask had about the, that. Yeah, they both have this very different, almost a different model. So PUBG Mobile actually technically came out in China last year uh, because they have a giant player base uh, across across the ocean and specifically in Asian countries. Um, and so I, it made sense that they kind of launched it there. And then they launched it when they started launching it here. Um, which I'm not sure how much this was expedited by Fortnite because Fortnite definitely announced it was coming here and then you sort of saw PUBG kind of moving. Um, but PUBG Modal, Mobile, uh, they technically first la launched on Android and as their sort of soft launch, it was Android in the Canadian market, which I happened to be a lucky Canuck, so that was nice for me. Um, and then it moved over to iOS in the Canadian market and then they very quickly made it, you know, US, iOS and Android and then now it's worldwide. Um, but Fortnite's been doing this invite only system um, and it's specifically on iOS right now. It's not, hasn't even hit Android and probably won't for a couple months seems to be the, the kind of going opinion on, on the release schedule there. Um, and I think it's fascinating to see, to see the response to both. Uh, I remember um, if you looked, if you looked over on our, one of our uh, other sites, Android Central, at the coverage of Fortnite when it's kind of first announced, and it, and people were like, "Oh, it's only coming to iOS." You'll have a lot of people saying, "Oh, well, PUBG Mobile's on Android in China already, and it's going to launch soon." Uh, and more people were like, "If you know, if Apple's going to, if Apple, because it's Apple's fault, obviously, <laughs> if Apple's going to forget about us, then we're just going to forget about the game." But it's to me, it's more interesting to see you where the market is. And I'm, I'm curious to follow both of these games and sort of see, especially through this launch stage as Fortnite's still rolling out and only on iOS, sort of like 
how successful both are going to be in terms of not only in terms of dollars, but also in terms of adoption. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting how, how different companies see the play, I guess, when coming to mobile. Um, and there's still sort of, um, that focus, uh, I guess, Fortnite for, for them, for Epic games, I suppose their focus was really on getting into the, into the iOS and getting into the Apple users. Um, whereas PUBG didn't seem to be as concerned with that. And people say us a lot. It's, and, and it's true. It's hard to avoid Fortnite and PUBG are in direct competition with each other. So it's kind of cool to me to see how they've, uh, they've sort of done the opposite as in Fortnite's on this inv invite only. And then PUBG is like, we're available everywhere. <laughs> and then uh, Fortnite's, so close to each Fortnite's other. Been, been Apple only and PUBG is like, oh, well, we were on Android and Apple. And it's, it's interesting to see that battle, the battle of tactics. It's not just the battle of what game you think is better or, you know, which sells more, but also just like, they seem to be going in opposites of each other, which I've, I've found really funny, but also really interesting. Um, but the end result is still the same, which is we're getting awesome AAA games coming to the mobile platform that you can play anywhere that get people involved that are multiplayer. Um, and in Fortnite's case, unfortunately, this isn't the case in PUBG as of right now, but in Fortnite's case, you also technically can play with your console and your PC friends too, um, which is something that uh, PUBG hasn't explored yet. Um, However, every time I've played with some of my friends uh, with my mobile version on their console or PC, I get torn to shreds. Because uh, <laughs> as good as the controls are, and they actually are very impressive, they're, they're quite intuitive and quite good, but they're still touchscreen controls versus either game pads or a keyboard and mouse. And there's just not really quite a comparison yet. Um, there, one is definitely a little more precise and a little easier to control than the other. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that not being cross-platform is actually hurting PUBG Mobile all that much, uh, because more often than not, I'm looking to play Fortnite with other mobile players so that we're all in the same playing field. Makes sense. Yeah, I would, that, I'm glad you touched on the last part because that was the one other question that I had. I had read about there being on-screen joystick controls, and usually that spells certain doom for games. Like people get apparently really upset like ah, I don't want to play with on-screen joysticks um, and so I was curious if they were going to try and translate uh, you know motions into uh, gestural type stuff for for mobile so it's interesting that they still worked in those on-screen controls now is that the same for PUBG and Fortnite or does Fortnite not have uh, on-screen joystick type controls no yeah it's the same for both games um, and I'm, you'll see, and if you've read any of my reviews or any of the games I've ever looked at, like I always want to reach for my MiFi controller when I'm playing a game. It's just such a, it is, to me, it's a better experience. That's from somebody who's been a console gamer for my whole life pretty much and then sort of adopted this mobile gaming uh, later, later in life. Uh, but Fortnite and PUBG as of right now do not support any sort of Bluetooth controllers if you're on Android or MiFi controllers if you're on uh, Apple and they're all on screen controls and that can be the death of a game. It really can because it's frustrating. If you can't actually do what you're trying to do in a game, you're not going to have a good time with it. You're not going to be, it's not going to be enjoyable. Um, and both games have done a really good job of making the controls pretty intuitive. Um, they both have great tutorials for you to sort of like learn the controls. They both have really good screens. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's on stick joystick uh, or on screen joystick controls for for uh, the left uh, for your left uh, thumb, I guess. Uh, if that uh, and uh, they've done some interesting things like uh, in PUBG, you can if you're holding it up and then you swipe up, you'd like it'll keep running, and then all you have to do is move your right uh, finger, and you can take your left finger off, and then you're doing run. Uh, you're constantly running, so you don't have to be holding your finger there the whole time, which is kind of nice. And Fortnite does the same thing. It's a little different. Instead of swiping up, you double tap um, and it'll just keep running. It'll auto run for you, um, which are both nice touches for the for the mobile device because it's a lot harder to sprint uh, than it would be on a controller or um, on a keyboard or mouse. Uh, and the other thing that they've done, that both games have done um, that's been really good is they have added sort of some specific mobile friendly mechanisms uh, into the way the game plays, um, both with uh, auto aim assist, mm -hmm. um, which some people hate uh, when you're on a console or you're on PC because you can be way more precise. But it's almost necessary on the mobile. But it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like it takes you over. It just feels like it does those little tiny adjustments 
that you wouldn't necessarily be able to make as easily on a touch screen. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to make you some sort of, you know, vastly superior sniper because you have a bit more auto aim. I think that they took, they, uh, uh, they took a great care in, in developing both games. Um, but it does keep you kind of on par with the fact that you're not constantly missing because you can't make those tiny little tweaks you need to make when somebody's, you know, just off of your crosshairs. Right. Um, so I've really enjoyed that. I think that that's really uh, brought the barrier down and made the mobile experience way better. Um, and another thing that, uh, uh, so Fortnite and PUBG have done this both differently. So I'll talk about Fortnite really quickly. So Fortnite has added sound indicators. So they don't have this on the on the PC or the console game, but because normally playing a game like this, using headphones is what people like to do because you really want to hear, because you'll hear the shots around you or you'll hear the footsteps around you. And while you can definitely still do that in Fortnite where your headphones or just listen to the game's audio, they also put in sound indicators around your character. So you can, you'll see a little foot pit prints pop up um, in sort of the area that the, that the sound is coming from. Um, and that sort of, also sort of breaks down the barriers of like, well, if I am playing this on the go and I don't happen to have headphones on me and I'm on the bus and I'm not able to hear, you know, the, you know, the nuances of, of where all the sounds are coming from. I have these indicators on the screen, which are great, which I've definitely used when I've been walking around and I've been playing this game uh, in a mobile sense. Um, PUBG has done it a bit differently. Uh, PUBG is also they really go for like a more realistic kind of like gritty tone. Like in the game is like a little more realistic lo looking and it's a little more like military esque sort of looking. Uh, so I think they wanted to keep that. So they don't, they don't have screen indicators for people just running around or shooting. But if you do get shot in PUBG, an indicator will pop up about where you got shot from on the screen. So it'll show like a red, a red space sort of in, in like a compass and it'll show it in a, area and then you sort of know where the shots are coming from um which is another way it's a it's a little less in, intrusive than what fortnite did but it's still really helpful for those times where you know your iphone speakers maybe aren't as good you don't have your headphones on with you or you're trying to you know get a quick game in on the bus when you're you know going to and from somewhere um so i've liked that both both games um didn't just focus on let's bring this game to mobile and launch it and get a bunch of people playing it and hopefully make some money. But they've also intentionally made the game for a mobile experience, um, which is important for mobile gamers because I'm, I don't want to play a game that I can't control. That doesn't make sense. That, um, you know, doesn't let me play it the way I want to um, when I'm out and about. Um, as much as I love, you know, throwing on a game of headphones or throwing on a great, a great set of headphones and, gaming on my couch. I also love mobile gaming because I can walk around and go to, go to the park or when I'm waiting for the bus, I can pull out my phone and, and, you know, play a game with, you know, people or by myself. Um, and I, th I think they've both focused on, on making that, um, a really, a really good experience on mobile. And I've been really, really impressed with the changes that they've made. Um, and none of it feels, none of it feels like, how you know it's good is that none of it none of it feels out of place. None of it feels like um, none of it feels like it shouldn't be there. It all sort of feels intuitive and sort of natural, um, which is fantastic. I've I've been really enjoying that with both games. Excellent. Um, any last thoughts from anyone uh, on Fortnite or PUBG before we head on to the next topic? I guess I have a question for you, Luke. Which one is your favorite? Oh man, that's so hard to answer. Um, I mean, I could, I could be, I could be a cheat and say I technically have won a game of PUBG Mobile, and I have yet to win a game of Fortnite. So I could say that PUBG is my favorite. Um, it's it's really hard because in they are so similar mechanic and gameplay wise, um, but they. They are different games, sort of at their at their at their core. They try to accomplish different things. And personally, for my personal taste, I think Fortnite's a little better. Um, I think that's a very personal taste thing. I'm sure there's people in the comments already yelling at me, but um, I, that's a very personal taste thing. I think I've just always been a fan of uh, of games that kind of like you know have this, especially shooters. Any any game that are you know primarily shooters, I like when they have something else going on. I like the building system in Fortnite. It's kind of a fun way of, 
of adding uh, sort of a different element to the game where you can build stuff kind of on the fly to block enemy bullets or like, you know, barricade yourself in a building or make a building where there isn't a building when you're standing in a field. Um, so I've really enjoyed that aspect. Um, and how I said, I've, I, and it's interesting because I, like I said at the beginning of the show, I hadn't, um, I hadn't really played Fortnite on PC or console like I had played PUBG. Um, so I was kind of expecting going into it that I would be more on the PUBG side of things. But I think Fortnite has sort of won me over a little bit. Um, and I think it's a, it, it does a little better. Um, it does a little better with those. I think those sound indicators are just so huge for me because there are so many times where I play the game without headphones on and I can't really hear what's going on uh, because I am using it in a, in a mobile space and I'm walking around with it. Um, that I think those sound indicators have been like huge for making the game really enjoyable. And I still feel competitive, even if I can't hear the slightest footsteps uh, that are kind of uh, beside me. So I think Fortnite win wins out for me just like by a hair. That being said, I've been playing both games a ton and I enjoy them both. And they both do, um, I would suggest to anyone who's on the fence about either of them, um, whether if you're just waiting for a Fortnite invite or you haven't decided to grab one yet, I would say try both games definitely. Um, if you haven't played them at all, if you have played them on PC and console, you probably already know what you're getting yourself into. But if you're one of those people who haven't played them at all, like perhaps Micah, um, I would say play both. See which one you like more, see which community you might, uh, you like interacting with more and go from there. Because at the end of the day, they're both really solid games. There's no reason not to have at least one of them on your iPhone uh, if you like these sort of games. So I would suggest to everyone, play both. Which one lets me shake a tree and pick cherries? <laughs> uh, none, I guess. <laughs> okay. It's called Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. <laughs> okay, uh, we should go ahead and move on. I want to tell you all about our sponsor. Can you guess? Can you guess? You guessed. It's Thrifter. Thrifter is a new way to save money on everything from gadgets to home goods by shopping based on value and not hype. That means you're getting actual real deals, not a bunch of those fakey fake deals. If you sign up at thrifter.com, you're going to get thoughtfully selected tech deals from places like Amazon and Best Buy Daily. It's all the stuff and none of the fluff. Uh, as per usual, we'll have everybody go on over to Thrifter and see what they like there and tell us a little bit about it. But I am going to tell you all that I bought that $10 drone that we talked about last week it's on Thrifter. So cute. Because it's of course, baby. it's so adorable. And it was it's only 10 bucks. And I am it's so wee. I'm incredibly impressed impressed with how well it works for only being 10 bucks. It's got a little Wi-Fi chip inside instead of like Bluetooth or something else. And so the connection is very good. And uh, that makes the controls really easy to use. I have since found out that my dogs are very unhappy with drones. Um, <laughs> so the second the buzzing started, they were just out. Um, but it, it's, it, it, I, again, I'm like super impressed with how well it works for only having cost uh, $10. Um, so I got that deal on Thrifter last time and I was happy to have done it. Um, but let's go to our GDC consultants, boots on the ground, seeing anything exciting uh, on Thrifter today. Yes, the Iron Giant, the movie is on Blu-ray for five bucks on Amazon right now. Just five? And if you don't own the Iron Giant, you need you to fix that right now. Yeah, you're not living your best life if you don't know yeah. Iron Giant. That's <laughs> yeah. For five bucks, there's just no Chase your bliss. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for $5, it's, it's worth $20. That movie is amazing. So for $5, you're really getting a great deal. It's good. Um, I also found um, Back to Bed is on sale right now for a dollar. And I've played this game, and it's adorable. It's about this little man who's walk he's going around sleepwalking. And through puzzle adventuring, you, you send him back to bed, basically. And uh, it's normally $3, and it's on sale for $1. So 99 cents. You can't beat that. So get on your phone right now. Go to the App Store. Download the game for 99 cents. Go through Thrifter, actually, because it's right there on the home page. So you can see it, click on it, go straight to the App Store, download it, and play it. It's fun. Six bucks later, and you've got the Iron Giant and an awesome game. Rin, what deal do you have for us? Oh, boy. Okay, so 
My first thought was like the motion activated bed lights sounded amazing. I'd never even seen this, but then I thought better of it because of cats. Uh, so instead, <laughs> I'm going to recommend um, the Victorinox Chef's Knife, uh, which I have owned for many years. It was my first big kitchen purchase, uh, and it's only $30. And it it is such a great, like, for, for what it is, obviously it's not going to be like $300 Japanese steel, but it is so much better than the crud that you'll buy at Target or Walmart or whatever. Um, and I like I can't recommend that knife highly enough. So to see it discounted ten bucks, I'm like, all right, that's my that's my pick. Excellent. And last but not least, Luke, what do you got for us? Well, because I'm low key obsessed with these, and I know too many people who are, so I could definitely give it away as a gift, even if I didn't want to keep it. Uh, I'm going to go with the Funko Pop uh, Harry Potter action figure. Uh, Funko Pop are those like those little like big head uh, action figures. I'm sure you've seen them around. They're insanely popular. Um, and the Harry Potter one's on for like six thirty one on Amazon right now. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So like if you're a collector of those and don't have that yet, or if you know someone who really loves Harry Potter, they make great little gifts. Um, I've given them to a lot of a lot of friends uh, for you know stocking stuffers at Christmas and things like that. Um, but if you're looking for something or you just want uh, to decorate your desk a little bit and you really love Harry Potter. I think that's a, that's a fun little thing to get yourself or to get to someone else. Awesome. Sounds great. So again, you're going to go to thrifter.com to sign up to get thoughtfully selected tech deals like awesome new drones or Funko Pops or, mm -hmm. uh, or kitchen knives. So again, it's not just tech deals, it's deals in general. And mm -hmm. it's all based on value, not hype. Go there. It's all the stuff and none of the fluff. We love you, Thrifter. Thanks for sponsoring the iMore Show. All right. It's time to move on to what has quickly become a well-known and very important topic. Uh, it is all about Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and a certain uh, researcher named Alexander Kogan. Uh, so I'm gonna quickly give a little brief before we break out into the discussion here so everybody sort of knows what's going on. A long time ago, 2007, Facebook launches a tool. It's called Facebook Platform. Basically what that does is it lets people log into other services, other sites and other apps using Facebook. But along with that, it also gives those apps and services your data and in uh, many cases also your friend's data which is not great. In 2013, a Cambridge University researcher named Alexander Kogan created a personality quiz. That quiz got installed by about 300,000 people. Thanks to that Facebook platform from 2007, 50 million Facebook users' data was scooped up by this personality quiz. In 2014, Facebook says, yo, 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 this is a bit of a problem, not specifically talking about the uh, personality quiz, but just in general, their, their service. So they started to sort of cut back on how apps can access data and what uh, requires approval. Well, 2015 comes around and Facebook learns that, guess what? That guy who uh, got all that data from 50 million Facebook users, apparently he shared that data with Cambridge Analytica, which goes against Facebook's guidelines. So Facebook bans him from the app and says, hey, we need you to prove that you're definitely not uh, still holding on to all of that data. Well, come 2018, uh, the Cambridge Analytica was apparently still holding on to the data or didn't delete all of it or were, were not being completely honest. Uh, and Facebook said, well, now we'd really like you to do a forensic audit so that we can prove that you don't have that data anymore. So from the creation of Facebook platform to the creation of a personality quiz that scooped up 50 million Facebook users' data, we now have a, a campaign for many people to delete Facebook and Facebook's dealing with the aftermath of all of that. Serenity, I just would like to hear your thoughts on all of this in general. Oh boy, uh, uncontrollable screaming. Uh, no, I, um, I've been, you know, <laughs> kindly, kindly suggesting that people uh, not keep super personal data on Facebook for a long time. Uh, and just in general, I feel like social networks, you know, I, my standby is that anything you share on a social network will be public at some point. I just have this like sinking feeling of like, we've seen too many like celebrity nude photos. I'm just kind of like anything that you share on the internet, you have to assume that there's a small grain that it's going to become public and that people 
you know, might use it for nefarious gain. So my stance has always been kind of like, if you're going to use Facebook, don't give it all of your information. Maybe, you know, not necessarily outright lie, but tell it things from a different point of view, uh, to, to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, and when this came out, I was kind of like, man, I'm, I'm really glad that my religion is a madman quote right now. That, you know, it's just like, I'm really glad that uh, my birthday is private only to me on Facebook. Uh, and I started thinking about this and I'm like, yeah, but on the other hand, you know, I, I may be a, a wee bit paranoid about personal data on the internet because of my, my profession, but there are many people who use Facebook, you know, because they want to share photos with their family or in some areas, you know, Facebook offers free or very low cost and barrier to entry to access the internet. Uh, that may be the only internet that they have. And it starts becoming a, a larger question um, we, and almost linked to the net neutrality issue where it's like, well, if, if Facebook's the only way that you can access information, um, shouldn't you, you know, feel like your, your information should be safe and should be controlled? And I do think, you know, Facebook it took them far too long. Um, but the, the point is valid that this data was collected back when they were much younger and more naive about how much data could potentially be used for, for terrible, terrible purposes. Uh, and, you know, it is. We all were. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. It's far less like we didn't, we never, we were so busy thinking about what we could. We didn't stop to think <laughs> that we should. Um, I actually saw a really great thread uh, on Twitter, of all places, uh, the other day talking about science Twitter. And science, uh, like science has had these reckonings, like physicists had the reckoning with the atomic bomb, where it was like we were in such a rush to split the atom that we didn't think about what would happen when we split the atom. Um, and this this is not quite a reckoning for for computer science, but um, but I think it's kind of the tip of the iceberg between this and like the stuff with the FBI and Apple a few years ago. Like we're really starting to think uh, Amazon Echo storing your voice recordings and whether or not to release those to developers. You know, that was a story from earlier last year. Um, there are all of these questions that we have about privacy and about, uh, you know, what what value, you know, what is our privacy? If we're using a free service, are we consenting to say here, you know, we are using a free service in exchange for our data? Or even if we're using a free service, do we have, you know, some rights to say this is how our data is being used and we don't want you to use it this way? We will consent to essentially paying for our data for you personally, but giving data to third parties is a bigger deal. So I don't know. I, I think it's a very complicated issue. I think Facebook, uh, because of everything that's happened with the election and Russia and everything else that's been going on, um, Facebook is kind of square flat in the middle of it. Uh, but that's that's not to say that other social networks are exempt. That's not to say that Twitter, like Twitter's had its own bits and pieces of reckoning, but like there's there's something to be said about all social networks and, and web web-based services uh, and how they collect information and how they use information. I think we're going to have to start seeing much more, like much clearer uh, privacy outlines and like what we do with your data, what we don't do with your data. Like it's, it, people are starting to be aware of what's going on. I have, I have lots more thoughts, but I don't want to speak yet since I just did that huge summary. So I'm curious uh, what, um, what, what, what our boots on the ground have to say uh, about Facebook and social networking in general. Because Russell, I really appreciate um, how many times you have written different pieces approaching things from a parent's perspective. Uh, your different guides on sort of social media and parenting have been incredible. And uh, so, you know, with this in mind that by being friends with someone who at the time would like sign up for an app and then it would get this person's data, that's pretty troubling regardless of age. Uh, but particularly if you had, which I know many of us did, um, either ourselves in my case or uh, had family members who were younger, like lie about their age so that they could be on Facebook. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, th was this a surprise to you? Was this just sort of like, well, yeah, something you should have expected, uh, just thoughts in general? 
The, this wasn't a surprise to me. Uh, the The scope of it was uh, uh, alarming, uh, but I, you know, there's always kind of the the suspicion that something like this uh, was possible. I, I found myself, you know, being in a unique position to not have to write immediately about this, uh, and and will probably at some point in uh, when I'm not in San Francisco. Uh, but uh, we're not talking about how much energy Facebook has been putting recently into getting our kids onto Facebook. Uh, you know, Facebook Messenger for Kids has been a recent initiative for Facebook over the last couple of months. And that hasn't entered this part of the conversation yet. Uh, you know, with, with all of this uh, personal information and, and whether we trust Facebook to, to maintain that information, it's important to keep in mind that at the same time, Facebook is actively trying to give your children their own dedicated profile where those kids are sharing their own information and not having those best practices. And it really just kind of circles back to uh, Facebook as an organization uh, is very similar to Twitter uh, in that they have positioned themselves as uh, the, 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 the building with which a community lives in uh, without taking any account for themselves without taking any responsibility for themselves as as the maintainers of that building. And that that's going to be a huge problem from multiple angles. Like this is this is very much uh, you know one step R Renee did a really good job uh, documenting just the many different ways in which Facebook has kind of misstepped recently uh, or even not recently just kind of over the company's history. Uh, and it's never from from the perspective of of things that they could have done to prevent it, it's it's you know the the most recent thing that Mark Zuckerberg said uh, was was really a, a calling out a listing of bad actors uh, when they were like, hey, yes, we messed up. Here are the the individual things that went wrong, but none of the things that Facebook has said so far has said we should have done better to begin with to keep your information safe. It was these people messed up, and that's that that is a deeply flawed approach to ensuring that I uh, trust you moving forward. It's something that, you know, when you look at how Apple approaches security and privacy, it's very much a, you know, you get to choose certain amounts of information that get shared, but it is 100% your choice, which is a, a separate position from the way Google handles things, uh, which is, you know, a lot of this information is available, but, uh, but you have to trust that we're going to do the right thing here. And the difference between Google and Facebook in this situation is that Facebook has routinely let us down, uh, and now they also want access to our kids' information. So it's, it's, it's a weirdly frustrating thing to see just the lack of responsibility uh, on Facebook's part. Uh, agreed. Um, I think that's one of the reasons, you know, sort of watching Facebook, they, the leaders clearly took their time and sort of trying to come up with what needed to be said and also what passed all of the lawyers <laughs> check marks, I'm sure. Um, and what Zuckerberg plans to do next. Cause what was interesting, I think in his, uh, post, this gigantic post that he wrote on Facebook is how he talked about the fact that Facebook really did the biggest step in sort of fixing this back in, as, as I mentioned, 2014, whenever they completely rewrote sort of how apps can use Facebook platform to gain people's data. And the fact that, again, the Alexander Kogan um, personality quiz happened in 2013, a year before Facebook made those changes. Um, and along with that, it's sort of what is going to happen next. And they outlined a, a three-step plan, including um, investigating all of the apps that were in place before 2014 uh, to see if any of the other ones may have accessed a bunch of data that they shouldn't have. Um, and then they're also going to be even further restricting data uh, access like through Facebook platform. And so there's gonna be more required there. And then uh, lastly, they're going to be, and I think this is the most important thing, but I don't think like, I'm I'm quick to just like say Facebook is the worst and blah blah blah, but I'm trying to be sort of uh, on the just pull myself away and take the Vulcan to Vulcan approach here and just be logical. I think that this is the most important step and the one that's going to uh, potentially make the most changes because 
everyday people aren't paying attention to those first two steps. But the last one is that at the top of your news feed, you're going to start to see little flags that say, hey, you know, really, we want you to take a look and see what what your apps, uh, what you've given access to, which apps have access to your data. And again, a lot of people don't like to click into those things and, you know, don't pay attention to them necessarily. But I think they'll get more people in that way. And also, they'll have people like me who's going to go to all of my family members and say, when that shows up on your Facebook, go check that out. Because I, I was just talking, uh, this was the one thing that I wanted to touch on. The day that I was writing this story, so yesterday when I was writing this uh, sort of uh, summary and, and rehashing of, of what Mark Zuckerberg had said, um, I was on Facebook, obviously reading it, and my grandma uh, messaged me on Facebook, which I hadn't like talked to her on Facebook in a long time. I was like, "Oh, it's so weird seeing you here," and it was just her birthday a couple days ago, and so she was like reading through her Facebook, uh, you know, posts on her wall, and she's like, "It's so nice. I uh, came on here just to just to." respond to these messages and now I'm setting up lunch dates and I'm going to be going out with these friends of mine that I haven't seen in a while. It's like, I am so uninterested in Facebook and so tied into Twitter and, you know, don't really care about the, that platform that it's easy for me to cast aside any value that you can get from it. But for her, that's a huge deal, reconnecting with old friends. Um, she's a not too terribly recent widow, but a widow nonetheless. And so like having the opportunity to go hang out with people is a fantastic thing. Um, so uh, that, that was kind of a moment for me to go, okay, like I see that people do get value out of this. And I'm glad that Facebook is taking of all the steps that last one to say, look, here it is right here. All you gotta do is click, we'll walk you through what apps have your ac have access to your data. Because when push comes to shove, now that Facebook's been caught, uh, which again, that they handled that poorly in communicating in the first place like they should have. But now that Facebook's been caught, it's bad business um, all the way through for them to not take steps to uh, fix this. I mean, we saw that with Uber, like it made a big difference when they had the delete Uber campaign, delete your account. And uh, I think they want to get ahead of this delete Facebook campaign for sure. I, I kind of, I feel that what what's what we're missing here is that all, all of these companies that collect our data are collecting our data and they're telling us in the terms and services the terms and conditions we collect some of your data and we don't share them with everybody we only share them with um other companies that will help us give you a better performance so we know a little bit and we don't know everything and it, to me from the consumer side we need access to literally every tiny bit of detail that somebody is getting from us so that we can decide for ourselves whether or not we want to share that information. Not whether or not a third party app is getting it, but what's being given to that third party app. What is what is Facebook collecting? Is Facebook collecting where where I go, um, the websites that I visit, the the um, mood that I'm in today? Like everything it should be completely transparent not this sort of general yes we share our, your information with only people that will help us create a better experience for you what are you collecting in the first place to to all of the companies that are collecting data which is everybody pretty much on the internet there i i kind of feel like there should be sort of this all purpose website where i can go in and i can i can enter my name and every bit of information that's being collected by me is there. And then I can say, oh, it looks like, you know, Facebook is collecting way more data than I feel comfortable with doing. So maybe I don't want to participate in what Facebook collects from me. And, and I go in and I do some things in the settings that fix that. Or I see, you know, oh, well, Twitter isn't really collecting as much data from me as I originally thought. So I feel pretty comfortable with them or, you know, something like that so that we have a little more controls awesome. it's it's a very one-sided situation companies are collecting our data and not telling us what they're collecting from us it's it shouldn't be so one-sided we should have control and access and it should be much more transparent than it is it's not just facebook it's it's everything on the internet everyone is collecting our data and we should just be able to know what that is and then we can decide for ourselves how we feel about that if somebody is tracking my my website um, you know, like my website activities and they're doing it just so that they can 
better advertised to me, I'm not going to care. If they're yeah. collecting my website data and they're trying to make money somehow um, by, you know, selling it to somebody who's going to hack my computer, you know, like there's there should be a lot of transparency in how we how we how we are able to know what mm -hmm. what data they're collecting of ours. Yeah. And of course, the the catch twenty two here is that you pitch the idea of like, oh, this service where I, where I log in and I find out. And it's like all of that requires that all of that data be shared with that magical service. So then it then it becomes a question of like, oh, well, there's a possibility of breaches there. And it, so it's a it's a really tough problem to solve. And but I do I absolutely agree with you, Lori, that. I, I think it should be kind of a stick in the ground that like, you know exactly what you're sharing with some, with a, with a company, exactly what it's being used for and exactly what it won't be used for. Uh, one of the companies I actually think is doing a really good job. Apple is of course, but um, I actually was really impressed reading Google's privacy policy yesterday. I was doing some research for a smart speaker roundup and uh, the, the contrast between trying to find uh, what Alexa shares and does not share and what uh, what Google Home shares and does not share was mind blowing <laughs> was just kind of like Google Home's privacy policy or Google. Yeah, Google's privacy policy is right there. It's written in clean English. It all makes sense. And they like they pretty much say in bold letters, it's like we're not selling your data. Like it would be kind of dumb for us to sell your data because we want to use it ourselves to make your ad experience better. Um, and like, again, Google has issues too. There's still the, you know, even if Google's not selling data, it's important to know what kind of data is being collected. But I do like, I think that common sense privacy policies written in, in clean English and not legalese are going to be really important going forward. And, uh, you know, I, I applaud Facebook for making those little widgets at the top, but it really needs to be something that everybody's checked into, right? Where it's like, you just like we know at this point, or at least I hope we do, about the importance of using strong passwords and changing your passwords. I kind of want like this is the next step. Check and make sure who's using your data and what your data is being used for. And are you sharing too much? And are you sharing too little? Like these are things that as we evolve as a digital society, we're going to need to really think about. Um, and it is worth noting that like we're talking all about about all this tracking stuff. It's like, yeah, we're like not hypocrites exactly, but like iMore does use trackers, you know, all of the mobile nations things do use trackers. Um, but we've been, this has prompted like a discussion amongst ourselves about like, how can we best use those, you know, in a way that's not intrusive to your privacy, but still allows us to serve you ads that are more like pointed to your, to your interest or also also the conversation of can we get away with not having ads which is a which is a, i feel like a daily conversation amongst uh amongst the staff here uh so it's like it is something we're thinking about um we've been talking about like maybe we can make it so that trackers are opt in in that like you won't be tracked unless you intentionally like press a button that says like i'm okay with this so we're like we're what I appreciate about this Facebook debacle is insane and frustrating as it is, is it really has started a positive discussion, you know, here amongst uh, the, everything. And I'm hoping that that will that will bleed over to other companies, that they'll really take a hard look and be like, hey, maybe we don't want to end up like Facebook six months down the line. Maybe we should think about how we're dealing with our privacy. Yeah. Uh, Luke, any uh, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess just like a, a word of, of advice, if I had anything about this, is just like, um, just be careful when you download apps and stuff that that want you to sign in using Facebook um, and other services like, and other services that want you to do that. Just just be aware um, as, as much as, as much as this, this whole, incident has has been really disheartening in a lot of ways it's like always a good refresher that like you should be keeping in mind your security and I, and and trust me this is coming from someone who like sometimes doesn't think about it and doesn't like i mean until like last year i was one of those people who used the same password for everything i was one of those people like a year ago so i know how hard it is and how easy it is to be like eh, like nothing's gonna happen to me it's fine 
Um, and I, I know how easy it is to fall into that mindset because it, it's a pain sometimes to sort of keep up your security online, but it's really important. So even like when you're downloading apps or games or anything, if they want you to let, sign in with Facebook, like really check out what they want from Facebook, really check out what those permissions you're giving them are. Um, and you ultimately it comes down to you. If, if you're deciding that that is a fine thing for that app, app or that service to grab from you, then that is your choice and you are definitely entitled to it. However, be aware of it. Know the facts. Know what they're looking, they're looking for. Know what they're using. Um, and I know it's hard sometimes. I know it requires a bit of extra work, but I think in the long run, it's, it, you don't want anything to happen to you. We all, we've all heard the horror stories. We know how bad it can be. We don't want any, any data going where it shouldn't be going and getting into nefarious hands. Um, and as much as we need to, we need to put pressure on companies to keep our best and to keep our interests at heart and to, you know, have common sense privacy policies. We also do need to realize that we, if we're going to be using these services and we're going to be an active participant in those communities, that we also need to take the onus on ourselves to sort of know what we're getting ourselves into. And I think, I think this has been a good reminder um, for people who are, you know, maybe less security conscious than they should be, aka myself, um, to like really, really push yourself to, to know what you're giving up and where you're giving it up and where it's going as much as you possibly can. So that would be my word of advice. Uh, and, and I know it can be frustrating and difficult, but trust me in the end, it's going to be way better than having anything horrible happen to, to data that you don't want out or, or, you know, that's going to make your life miserable. So, so it's way really important to, to know what you're getting yourself into. Very well put. Um, I think that brings us to the end of uh, this week's episode. We covered quite a few topics this week. Great job, everybody. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening, of course, for tuning in live or checking us out uh, in your podcast app of choice. Uh, thanks so much to Jim Metzendorf for editing the show. We love you, Jim. We will, of course, be back next week with a big anniversary number. Holy cow. Uh, but all that's left, of course, is to say goodbye and uh, tell everybody where we can find everybody. That's weird. Uh, if you're looking for me online, you can find me at Micah Sargent. Uh, you can find Renee Ritchie at Renee Ritchie. Uh, Serenity, if people are looking for you online, where can they find you? They can find me at Saturn, S-E-T-T-E-R-N, on Twitter and Instagram and not Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on iMore, of course. And Luke, if people are looking for you, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me at Luke Philippoage. So my last name is F-I-L-I-P-O-W-I-C-Z. Uh, and that's on Twitter. Uh, and yeah, look at look for my articles on uh, iMore. And uh, I hope to see you guys around. Excellent. And last but not least, Lori and Russell, where can folks find you? I'm at Russell Holly on basically everything. And I'm at Lori Gill at most of the social things. I am at Appaholic on Twitter, A-P-P-A-H-O-L-I-K. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everybody, for checking us out. And uh, we can't wait to talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>